I think we shall start. And uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our workshop on first semester screening and prevention of preeclampsia. And I'm your host today. I'm the including chairperson of this of the OEG department at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So essentially, uh, over the next three hours, we'll cover all you need to know about first semester screening and prevention of preeclampsia. And then um, before I start, um, uh, obviously I want to welcome our colleagues online uh, from, from Hong Kong, from across the world, as well as from mainland China. So the language we'll use today is English, and uh, so we'll, I'll try my best to speak uh, relatively slowly so everyone can understand me. Before I start, I, I, I need to uh, advertise that uh, it's actually... Uh, for me, it is a huge honor that we are launching a master program in maternal fetal medicine. I think this is the first in, in the world. Uh, it's a program that is delivered in English. Uh, I know a Spanish group delivers a fetal medicine uh, uh, master program, a diploma program in Spanish and uh, uh, UCLH. They deliver a fetal medicine program in English, but, but then it's no fetal medicine program. I think we're the first. And so uh, it's a very intense program, as you can see, part time over two years. And then you, you cover many aspects of fetal medicine as well as perinatal medicine, uh, maternal medicine, and, and clinical genetics. Our first uh, weekend uh, will be in September. I'm going to give you a spoiler to attract you because uh, uh, I packed 35 hours of lectures in September. And then uh, essentially there is one and a half day on fetal echo. And there will be hands on as well uh, because um, I've invited an expert from from London, from Brompton, to deliver a fetal echo program. So obviously, as part of the master uh, program, then you have access to that uh, fantastic uh, fetal echo course. And if you're interested to register, then you are welcome to scan this QR code. But you can speak to my team as well; they are all here to uh, share more information with you. It's a part-time course over two years, and we meet two persons over four weekends in one year. So anyhow, I shall move on, and uh, these are my disclosures. And uh, the most important thing is let's go, let's move on and, and get stuck into the topic of today. And I'll start with screening first. Some of you will have seen this slide already, and, um, and this is also something that we use in Hong Kong, and actually mainland China also adopts this. Uh, uh, screening approach, uh, both the UK and and the U and the US, uh, they recognize the need of screening in early pregnancy, and they've come up with a list of risk factors. And then uh, one was issued uh, by NICE in 2010, and then the other one was issued by ACOC in 2018. And then uh, you can see that the risk factors are divided into high risk factors and moderate risk factors. If you have one high risk factor, you're considered high risk, and if you have two or more risk factors, then you're considered um, uh, two or more moderate risk factors, and you're considered high risk. But what they haven't done is to work out um, uh, the screen performance. Okay, it's easy to do in clinic. You say, okay, you have these risk factors, then um, you can uh, uh, be determined as a high risk patient. But then they haven't given us the evidence to to convince us. So we actually took it upon ourselves to do this study. We included 120,000 women of, uh, with single term pregnancy, and we've confirmed that this approach of screening is okay only. Yes, it's, it's only achieving 30% um, detection rate for uh, preeclampsia requiring delivery after 37 weeks, and then the detection rate of 39% for preterm preeclampsia. So um, it's a simple approach. Uh, but uh, performance of screening is relatively suboptimal. If you think you can actually save the world with this approach, and then I think uh, you are deluded. So another issue is that it seems that this approach of screening is just too simple. Women are very, very clever. Most of you are women here, and I'm not here to discriminate. And if you go for Down syndrome screening, our pregnant women would like to receive a personalized risk to, to, you know, to make a decision about whether she should go for an invasive procedure. I think this is also the same uh, concept for other pregnancy complications. So what we have learned is that using the NICE approach to screening, we can only achieve a, a very low rate of adoption of aspirin. So only 23% of uh, high-risk women determined by the NICE approach would agree to take aspirin. So while you think you're doing good, 
to screen women with a checklist of risk factors and then operate as women. But only less than a quarter of women would accept because this is a very non-specific screening approach. We so have to move away from doing suboptimal screening. So don't be deluded to think that you are saving the world by asking them if they have had a case, if they've had previous history of preeclampsia. They may not take aspirin. You can't scare them enough. But I think if you give them a personalized risk, then they will listen more to you and then they will focus on how they can optimize their health and then prevent preeclampsia. So my work came in uh, in 2005. And then we started using uh, uh, logistic regression analysis to combine risk factors with various biomarkers. Biomarkers could be a measurement of blood pressure, could be the measurement of uterine artery doppler by ultrasound, or it could be a blood marker. But then in 2012, we moved away from using logistic regression, and now we're using the we're using competing risk approach. So competing risk approach is a very simple concept. We assume that every woman uh, would be pregnant forever, then all of them would have preeclampsia. And whether they actually have preeclampsia or not depends on whether the delivery occurs before the development of preeclampsia or after. So we have worked out that if a woman were to stay pregnant forever, for a low-risk woman, then the median gestational age of delivery with preeclampsia is 55 weeks. But in reality, she would have delivered before 42 weeks. So her risk is presented by this area under the curve, is the green part. The risk is very small. And if a woman has uh, several risk factors, then her curve will be shifted to the left and her area under the curve is substantially increased. And that is all taken care of in the risk calculator. Please do not worry. You don't need to do the mathematics. Okay, you don't need to do the mathematics and we do this for you. But what is good about this approach is that we can really generate an individual risk for an individual pregnancy. And actually, I talk a lot about preterm preeclampsia with the lift break before 37 weeks. But in fact, you may choose a different timing. You may choose a different gestational age cutoff. It could be less than 32 weeks, it could be less than 33 weeks, whichever cutoff you prefer that makes sense to your clinical setting. And we can also expand the equation with new markers very easily. When I started my research 20 years ago, every time I found a new marker, I had to do a new regression. And every time there will be a new equation. And to be honest, that is very, very, very inconvenient. So now, from our perspective, obviously, you are hopefully going to be the user of my model. And I'll continue expanding the model with new markers by just adding it on to the end of the equation. And also, the good thing about this approach is it takes into account the importance of um, the severity of well, the increasing effect of biomarkers with severity of breakouts. In simple words, so the higher the blood pressure, as shown in this scatter plot, the higher the chance of preterm preeclampsia with delivery before 37 weeks. And this is also the case for uterine artery doppler as well as PLGM. So how does it perform our model? For me, it's a no-brainer. I've been talking about this for uh, not 20 years, but I'm, I'm sure I've been talking about this for 10 years at least, combining all the numerous factors of preeclampsia with blood pressure, with placental growth factor taken in the blood. And then also, um, uh, there's somebody raising the hand. I don't know, uh, Stanford, there's someone always raising their hand. Is it, do I need to address this? Okay. And then you turn out your doctor by ultrasound. We are able to detect 90% of uh, early onset preeclampsia with the liver before 34 weeks. And then for preterm preeclampsia, the performance is 82%. For temporary clubs, it's 44%, which is not ideal. Nonetheless, if we do, do a head-to-head -head comparison with the UK-based NICE approach, we are able to double the detection rate at the same false positive rate. So for me, it's a no-brainer. We must stop just using a checklist of risk factors, which is non-specific, and it's also not quite adequate for an Asian population. And I'll show you the data to substantiate my point. So I know... I'm always challenged with what I do, but then I always keep quiet until I generate the results to, to show anyone else. So it's very important just to make sure that I do not tend to challenge anyone until I have data. So when it comes to the bar markers, uh, we have very, very standardized approach 
uh, in the measurement. First is the measurement of blood pressure. You're welcome to scan the QR code here, which will take you to the full video that we uh, generated during the COVID pandemic. The most important thing is that we need to use um, validated blood pressure devices. And then uh, because most of the blood pressure devices, they tend to underestimate blood pressure uh, in pregnancy as well as in women with preeclampsia. And that could be dangerous. You could be missing a case of preeclampsia. We need to make sure the woman's well rested. And then, then we need to measure, measure blood pressure in both arms simultaneously with the arms supported at the level of the heart. And so altogether, you take measurements uh, uh, twice. And then from, so altogether, you take measurements twice from each arm also, and then you have four measurements. We enter the measurements into the risk calculator. So the next I will not dwell on because uh, Dr. Caitlin Lau will give us uh, an, a very detailed uh, uh, lecture on how to measure uterine artery positivity index. But again, you are welcome to scan the QR code here that will take you directly to the full video. And then uh, and, and later on, our in-person uh, delegates will get to have some hands-on experience uh, on uh, the measurement of uterine artery PI. So when it comes to PLGF uh, measurement, I want to share with you some technical considerations, very important. And all, today we have a company uh, that produces PLGF re reagents here. You're welcome to talk to them. And then but, but from your perspective, from a clinical perspective, I just want to remind you all the key points because if you don't follow these um, uh, instructions, you are not going to be able to measure PLGF accurately. And I tell you, out of these bar markers, blood pressure, neutron artery doppler, and PLGF, PLGF has the widest variations every day in the quality assurance uh, uh, port. And if you don't follow our, our instructions, it is very, very dangerous because PLGF is also the most important bar marker for the screening of, of preeclampsia. It's the most uh, not important marker because it reflects the health of the, the healthiness of the placenta. And if you don't take it, if you don't take the blood well, what, what do I mean by that? The moment you put a tourniquet on, things will go wrong. Because if you put a tourniquet on for too long, then that will hemolyze the blood, then you basically with a high level of PLGF, and that will give you a false negative result. And if you, um, if you use uh, something wrong for cleaning the skin, uh, that's another point as well. Many of you would use RD to clean the skin. May I remind you that you should use alcohol, 70% alcohol, which is what we used to use. For, for the COVID pandemic. So another point is, um, once you have taken the blood, can you make sure you gently invert the blood two or five times to allow mixing of the blood with the medium? I don't know, do you take blood? I take blood on a daily basis. And then so maybe you are not aware of the need of kind of inverting the blood tubes. And then oh, and afterwards you need to uh, let the blood tube set for 30 minutes before you set speech. And afterwards we need to compare the quality of the serum Against the chart to make sure it looks nice and nice and clear, like urine. But then, uh, but that is obviously down to your laboratory. But you need to pass this message over to your laboratory to ensure quality. And then, in relation to a report, this is how a report looks. And most importantly, you will get the result, like the raw value, but you also get the result in a mum value. We correct uh, all these bar markers, including POGF, according to certain characteristics of the patient, the weight, whether she smokes, uh, etc. And that is important because the number in the bracket, in the parenthesis is important. This is a mum of 0 0.9, which is near one, relatively normal. But it could be a, a value of 0 0.1 mum. And that is extremely low, 90% lower than the median. Okay, so this is our legal guidelines, uh, HQ in 2019, and you're welcome to scan the QR code. That would take you directly to our risk calculator online, which is free of charge. And then the most important thing is that we recognize the need of using a standardized approach to uh, convert the bar markers into moms. And then a woman is high risk if her risk is one in 100 or more. And then our model is best for preterm preeclampsia, not term preeclampsia. But I, we have continued to work uh, on developing an approach to screening for uh, term preeclampsia. This is a very quick slide. Number I need to the screen for you to take back to your bosses to say we must introduce first trimester screening for preterm preeclampsia. The number needed to the screen is 250, which is equivalent to the number needed to the screen for preventing one case of early onset neonatal GBS infection. And then 
If you look on the left, the number needed to screen for preventing one case of cancer okay. is much higher than the 250,000 points in here. So for, for me, it's a no-brainer. We must introduce this the method of screening in early pregnancy. So in relation to implementing the screening model in Asia, uh, first thing that I did was to do a, a validation study. We collected data from 10,000 women. We worked out that uh, blood pressure is lower in Asian women naturally. But that is important because if naturally we have lower blood pressure, then that would then affect your detection rate, okay? Because we rely on the blood pressure to be higher uh, than, the, than, the, than the expected median. Then the, so we need to correct for this. Usual Doppler Doppler is okay in Asian women. And then for PLGF, and you can see the massive shift to the left, suggesting that PLGF is significantly lower systematically in Asian women. Again, this is extremely important because our babies are smaller, our placentas are smaller. So PLGF being lower is expected. And if we don't correct for this to make sure that the mom goes back to one median, then you are going to generate a higher fault positive rate because we expect uh, PLGF to be lower in high-risk women, yes? So this is extremely important. And that, therefore, in your day-to-day -day work, once you introduce the screening model, then you have to do QA, quality assurance analysis, uh, on a regular basis to monitor for these systematic shifts. Anyhow, moving on, comparing our Asian data to the uh, UK-based data, and, and um, most importantly, we have recognized that blood pressure is, is good for Asian data, and uh, PLGF is also very good. For uterine artery doctor, it seems that it's not as good in, in our Asian women in comparison to our uh, UK uh, patients. So, But I think the uterine artery doctor is still an extremely important component of our triple test, and hence we are organizing today's workshop for uh, getting some hands-on experience. So I was already referring to my paper here, uh, uh, the work of my uh, PhD student here from Thailand. Uh, so based on this uh, validation study of 10,000 cases, most importantly, if, if you look at the uh, graph on the right, if we compare ACOG and NICE approaches head to head against my model, then, then we can see that our model is definitely much better than the ACOG approach and the NICE approach. Why is it? I think in our in our geographic location, our women are thinner, younger, fewer comorbidities. If we rely on the history of chronic hypertension, a history of diabetes, and obesity of uh, BMI of thirty and above, and the age of forty and above, we are not going to be able to predict very well for uh, preterm pregnancy or any pregnancy. So, bottom line is um, the FMF test that we are introducing to this region. Is far superior than the ACOG and NICE recommendations. I think that, that we should not be using a recommendation from, from a very different population. I think that is extremely important. So, anyhow, I think time is getting tight, but then hopefully it's okay. We can finish on time. And then now, um, I want us to just think a little bit about how we can further improve screening. And I'm crazy because I want us to get up to 100%. I think we can get there. And then uh, we are developing a quadruple test. Uh, this is work of my PhD, uh, also from Thailand. And if I were to add on this bar marker, glycosylation fibrinectin, this is a marker of endothelial dysfunction. You know, uh, at the end, when the patient presents with brain cancer, there is widespread endothelial dysfunction. So it seems that in the first trimester of pregnancy, we can even consider adding a marker of endothelial dysfunction, glycosylation fibrinectin. We can actually uh, substantially increase the model to 83% at the same false positive rate for pre-term preeclampsia. And as for term preeclampsia, we're actually able to gain another 13% detection rate, up to 65%. So I think this is also the direction I will, I will go down is, is to identify other biomarkers, not related to presentation, because PLGF is really very strong as a marker of presentation. Anyhow, um, some of you might have seen this paper. I, I received so many messages on Facebook about my comments in relation to this nature paper. Oh my God, it's a nature paper. It must be amazing, right? And then, uh, but in the end, it turned out to be a dis uh, for, for me, it's a disappointment. This is a very interesting study in relation to cell free RNA. And then uh, three, uh, three validation cohorts and one discovery cohort. So essentially, the discovery frame was fantastic. Cell free DNA and future cell free RNA can achieve a sensitivity of 100%. 
and there's a specificity of 85%. But if you look at the three separate validation cohorts, and then you can you can be convinced that actually this of well, this approach to screening is really suboptimal. And AUCs are far lower than our expectation 0.7. 0.7 is considered moderate. When eight and above is considered good. And so we are in the process of converting some of this knowledge into a new test. Uh, we want to create a new PCR test. Well, when it comes to self rRNA, it involves sequencing. So it's extremely expensive. It requires about 80, 80 genes, as you can see. Only achieving detection at 51% as a 10% plus cost rate. But hopefully we'll get to the point whereby we can then replace my triple test, which is fine. I have no problem with that. So work of uh, one of our scientists, Stephen, and then uh, we basically picked out two placental markers from the Nature paper, and, and uh, we've optimized it, and we've discovered that actually um, these markers potentially can achieve an error in the curve exceeding 0.9. So watch this space that we are, although you're here today to learn about ultrasound, and um, but still we're, we're, we're far from actually replacing the triple test with new ball markers, but the work is underway. I want you to know that I'm not, not, I'm not entirely complacent with what we have. It's good, but we can certainly improve further. And then uh, I was alluding to the fact that neutral artery doctor may not work so well in our Asian cohort. So wondering whether we can actually move over to the eyes. Um, this is actually um, an important marker that has now been confirmed to be useful clinically, perhaps not in addition to neutral artery PI, but in a, co in a, in a setting whereby if we find that neutral artery PI may not be as effective in screening, maybe then the ophthalmic artery doctor can uh, uh, have a better role. Because I think when it comes to neutral artery PI, what I experience here is that a lot of pregnant women, they have contractions during the scan. And that makes us the, the measurement harder. Whereas the eye doctors, very simple to do, by the way. Hopefully, maybe in the next course we'll touch on this. And then uh, uh, and there's only one vessel there. No, no trouble with finding the arcuate artery in the eye, <laughs> at the base of the eye. And then uh, the things that um, this, I think, in addition to neutral artery PI, is not useful. But if we are thinking about replacing neutral artery PI, we can consider it. And this is something to explore. So future directions, I will not dwell on. And now I will very briefly, five minutes, touch on uh, prevention. Aspirin has a very long history. The Egyptians are like the Chinese. Really, we are very, we are very clever. And then we explore many, many ingredients. And then uh, they discovered the, the willow trees uh, could be, uh, in the ingredients from the willow trees could be effective in treating pain, headaches, fevers, and then um, in 1915, Bayer started developing these um, tablets. Uh, and now every year we uh, consume 40,000 tons. It's, it's incredible. So uh, well, we really wonder whether aspirin could also be um, uh, useful in preventing preeclampsia. But just a reminder that actually the question about the use of aspirin started from the 70s. And this is a, a, a project uh, of a, a project in the 80s and published in Lancet in the 80s. Uh, yeah. a, a trial carrying aspirin, 150 milligrams, with a peridamol daily from 12 weeks versus no treatment. And then they concluded that this regime could be could be protected against preeclampsia, fetal bone restriction, and IUD in high risk women. And the strange thing was that um, afterwards, so many trials were undertaken. And then, uh, and now I refer to the second uh, uh, landmark paper in the Lancet, 2007, uh, uh, meta-analysis, individual patient meta-analysis, um, and including 31 trials. Uh, and, and conclusion was disappointing. Only 30, uh, only 10 percent reduction in the rate of great pharmacy. But we need to think about why it was such a bad uh, re result. Well, three things is that only two trials were using 150 milligrams, irrespective of, well, the first ever trial was using 150 milligrams. And then many trials were starting aspirin at any time point. Some trials were only starting aspirin in a, in a third trimester pregnancy. And there were 15 different definitions of breakdowns. I think that is also a problem. So the meta-analysis that we saw, meta-analysis are, you know, a mixed bag of studies. And we need to really be 
be cautious when we interpret uh, results from meta-analysis. We can't just treat it as the gold standard. May I just remind you that meta-analyses, uh, uh, they, they have to be well done. Or that the trials that include, they include must be well done. So um, uh, essentially, uh, the work of which uh, the Canadian group uh, was, was really a game changer here. In 2010, when they published that, actually uh, giving aspirin before 16 weeks, then they could prevent uh, preterm preeclampsia. Uh, very dramatically, 90%. But of course, uh, I think uh, it's very difficult to uh, accept that, that that could be a 90% reduction of, of something, not in medicine. It's never happened before. So when we developed our trial, uh, ASPRO trial, we uh, actually did a power calculation based, based on 50% reduction, not 90% reduction. And then the rest is history. I think uh, most of you are familiar with these results. Uh, the work of our team, uh, Daniel and Neil from uh, from the FMF, and, and uh, you can see that by screening and treating with 150 milligrams of aspirin from 11, 14 weeks till 36 weeks every night, we can reduce the rate of uh, preterm preeclampsia by 62%. And if the compliance is good, and is, uh, so the, the, uh, the, the treatment effect size is even greater as 76%. So this is, again, a key slide for you to take back to the um, uh, your bosses. Uh, the number needed to treat. I think this is important. Any numbers below 100 will be considered good. Uh, so to prevent one case of preterm preeclampsia, we need to treat 38 pregnant women. And as for small babies, we need to treat 16 to 30 pregnant women. And as for preventing stillbirth, all we need to exactly to treat um, 34 women. So these numbers are very good. Again, I uh, refer to the FIGO guidelines. So I've already uh, emphasized the importance of. Uh, Compliance, and uh, most importantly, if I have a woman uh, who has screened high risk without one hypertension, then maybe we can even achieve a 95% reduction, uh, of, uh, in, uh, which is quite astonishing. So, another impact is in relation to prevent preterm birth because through the ASPRO trial, demonstrated a 68% reduction in accumulated length of stay in NICU, suggesting that we are really having impact in reducing preterm birth and optimizing health or the newborns. And what is important to recognize is that I know we hand over the baby to the pediatrician, but the impact of what you do in pregnancy is lifelong. If you don't reduce preterm birth, then you are going to increase all these complications for the child, cerebral so palsy, even uh, in the long term, in impaired work capacity. So someone would ask, how does aspirin work? How does it prevent uh, preeclampsia? So we have uh, done this analysis based on the ASPRO trial, we've learned that actually aspirin can reduce the, the measurements of neutral PI. This is a reflection of improved presentation, and that happens before 20 weeks. So this is why it's important for us to set aspirin before a certain time point. Uh, if you start it too late, then you cannot achieve good prevention. Uh, I've become obsessed with aspirin non-response. Why don't some high-risk women uh, respond to aspirin, and we worked out some risk factors. Uh, that's important in, uh, as part of counseling. Sadly, women with chronic hypertension, they don't respond to aspirin so well. Those with very low PLGF, less than 0 0.7 month, and those with super high risk, 1 in 2, 1 in 10, 1 in 11, 1 in 50. I think that makes perfect sense. Yes, it's very lo logical. And, and, and uh, when you have patients like this, you need to tell them that although Aspirin is going to have a positive impact, but I, I anticipate that you will still have preeclampsia. Still need to look out for signs and symptoms of preeclampsia. Don't be complacent. So in our work, we are, we have theorized that actually uh, aspirin can prevent preeclampsia by actually shifting the time from when as uh, when preeclampsia occurs. So by delaying the onset of the disorder, then we also push back on the timing as, as to when the, the baby needs to be born. And that obviously is important for both the mother and the child. And then the, uh, we've already demonstrated through some fancy metabolomics work that um, uh, aspirin can decelerate, can decelerate uh, uh, placental aging by 1.27 weeks. So that is uh, how we now counsel our high-risk women. We tell them that you are high risk, you're treated with aspirin, but don't be complacent, please. You still need to remember you are high risk, and uh, we are simply shifting the time, time point as to when you present preeclampsia and you, when you will deliver. 
And so you should still be vigilant about your signs and symptoms of preeclampsia. You should still be checking your blood pressure at home, et cetera. And just to finish off, I want to show you the uh, preliminary data of our forecast implementation trial. I can't show you the data because uh, they, um, because uh, the, the paper is under, under review. But very importantly, uh, in Hong Kong at our unit, by screening, uh, and then identifying the high-risk women, treating them with aspirin, we are seeing uh, a reduction of 50% in the rate of early onset preeclampsia, uh, near 40% uh, in preventing uh, preterm preeclampsia. So this is actually um, uh, compatible with our expectations. I know with the aspirin trial, we were demonstrating 60% reduction, but that is in a conventional trial setting. But now this is actually real life setting. And then, so this is a real life data that we're sharing with you. So in conclusion, we can, de we can definitely implement the combined test in Asia. We need to identify the, uh, uh, the differences in mom values for the local population. There should be a process of training, a process of uh, quality assurance, and then, uh, and I know it sounds a lot of work. Yes, it takes a bit of time to set up, but once it's up and running, and it is actually quite impactful because through my implementation trial, we've introduced the screen and prevent strategy. And now this hospital is continuing because uh, the risk data is extremely important for how we manage our patients. So thank you very much for your attention.